Right. Yeah, you can start Mati, Puja Mati, when you are ready. Okay. Hare Krishna, Advaita Acharya begged to be initiated by Madhavendra Puri. After initiating him, Madhavendra Puri started for South India. Going into South India, Sri Madhavendra Puri visited Remuna, where Gopinath is situated. Upon seeing the beauty of the deity, Madhavendra Puri was overwhelmed. In the corridor of the temple from which people generally viewed the deity, Madhavendra Puri chanted and danced. Then he sat down there and asked a Brahman what kinds of foods they offer to the deity. From the excellence of the arrangements, Madhavendra Puri understood by deduction that only the best food was offered. Madhavendra Puri thought, I shall inquire from the priest what foods are offered to Gopinath so that by making arrangements in our kitchen, we can offer similar foods to Sri Gopal. When the Brahmin priest was questioned about this matter, he explained in detail what kinds of foods were offered to the deity in, of Gopinath. The Brahmin priest said, in the evening, the deity is offered sweet rice in 12 earthen pots. Because the taste is as good as nectar, Amrit, it is named Amrit Keli. This sweet rice is celebrated throughout the world as Gopinath Kshira. It is not offered anywhere else in the world. While Madhavendra Puri was talking with the Brahmin priests, the sweet rice was placed before the deity as an offering. Hearing this, Madhavendra Puri thought as follows. If without asking, if without, if without my asking, a little sweet rice is given to me, I can then taste it and make a similar preparation to offer to my Lord Gopal. Madhavendra Puri became greatly ashamed when he desired to taste the sweet rice, and he immediately began to think of Lord Vishnu. While he was thus thinking of Lord Vishnu, the offering was completed and the Arati ceremony began. After the Arati was finished, Madhavendra Puri offered his obeisances to the deity and then left the temple. He did not say anything more to anyone. Madhavendra Puri avoided begging. He was completely unattached and indifferent to material things. If, without his begging, someone offered him some food, he would eat. Otherwise, he would fast. A Paramahamsa like Madhavendra Puri is always satisfied in the loving service of the Lord. Material hunger and thirst cannot impede his activities. When he desired to taste a little sweet rice offered to the deity, he considered that he had committed an offense by desiring to eat what was being offered to the deity. Madhavendra Puri left the temple and sat down in the village marketplace, which was vacant. Sitting there, he began to chant. In the meantime, the temple priest laid the deity down to rest. Finishing his daily duties, the priest went to take rest. In a dream, he saw the Gopinath deity come to talk to him, and he spoke as follows. O oh, priest, please get up and open the door of the temple. I have kept one pot of sweet rice for the sannyasi Madhavendra Puri. This pot of sweet rice is just behind my cloth curtain. You did not see it because of my tricks. A sannyasi named Madhavendra Puri is sitting in the vacant marketplace. Please take this pot of sweet rice from behind me and deliver it to him. Awakening from the dream, the priest immediately rose from the bed and thought it was wise to take a bath before entering the deity's room. He then opened the temple door. According to the deity's directions, the priest found the pot of sweet rice behind the cloth curtain. He removed the pot and mopped up the place where it had been kept. He then went out of the temple. Closing the door of the temple, he went to the village with the pot of sweet rice. He called out in every stall in search of Madhavendra Puri. Holding the pot of sweet rice, the priest called, Will he whose name is Madhavendra Puri please come and take this pot? Gopinath has stolen this pot of sweet rice for you. The priest continued, would the sannyasi whose name is Madhavendra Puri please come and take this pot of sweet rice and enjoy the prasadam with great happiness. You are the most fortunate person within these three worlds. 
Hearing this invitation, Madhavendra Puri came out and identified himself. The priest then delivered the pot of sweet rice and offered his obeisances, falling flat before him. When the story about the pot of sweet rice was explained to him in detail, Sri Madhavendra Puri at once became absorbed in ecstatic love of Krishna. Upon seeing the ecstatic loving symptoms manifest in Madhavendra Puri, the priest was struck with wonder. He could understand why Krishna had become so obliged to him, and he saw that Krishna's action was befitting. The priest offered his obeisances to Madhavendra Puri and returned to the temple. Then in ecstasy, Madhavendra Puri ate the sweet rice offered to him by Krishna. After this, Madhavendra Puri washed the pot and broke it into pieces. He then bound all the pieces in his outer cloth and kept them nicely. Yeah, thank you so much, Mati. So we'll see. Uh, one second. I think one that is the last verse, correct? Yeah. Okay, we'll go back to 111. So what happened uh, context-wise was Madhavendra Puri was a great sannyasi, a wonderful Vaishnava um, in the Madhva Sampradaya and then Brahma Madhva Sampradaya. And he, uh, we heard how he had the great fortune of deity coming in his dream and then telling him about uh, deity's whereabouts so asking him to take him out of that place where he was Didi was there for so many years like that and then he established the Didi worship by installing the Didi, getting the temple constructed establishing wonderful worship of Didi by training uh, brahmanas first initiating the brahmanas to vaishnavas and establishing Didi worship like that we heard right and then we also heard yesterday that how uh, Gopal Didi came in his dream and told him that I'm becoming very hot. Uh, even though you did so much Abhishek with so much water, I'm still hot. Um, can you please uh, go to, can you go to Jagannath Puri and get uh, best quality Malaya sandalwood and then apply sandalwood paste on my body like that he requested. Supreme Lord, uh, rather, rather ordered, we can say, he ordered Madhavendra Puri in his dream. So he's a elevated devotee, Madhavendra Puri. So then, uh, Madhavendra Puri started to Bengal and then he arrived at the house of Advaita Acharya Prabhu in Santipura. That's what we heard yesterday. And Advaita Acharya became very pleased upon seeing the ecstatic love symptoms of uh, that are manifest in Madhavendra Puri. That was a 110 verse we read yesterday. Now, one line verse is that Advaita Acharya begged this Madhavendra Puri to initiate him, it seems. So, after initiating him, Madhavendra Puri started for South India. This purport, this is a big purport for this verse. So, Prabhupada is emphasizing a couple of things in this verse. One is that Advaita Acharya is a householder and Madhavendra Puri is a sannyasi. In those days, uh, according to Pancharatra injunction, it seems, only householder Brahmana can initiate, it seems, in those days, according to that principle. Actually, it is counterintuitive for me because we would think uh, sannyasi is superior like that, we'll think, right? But Pancharatra statements are like that, it seems that only householder Brahmana can initiate. So, but uh, Parput tells one important point, which is a, a essential core, essential principle of our philosophy, actually. Sri Chitra Mahaprabhu says, Kiba vipra kiba nyasi sudra kena naya e Krishna tattva veta se guru haya. A person may be a Brahmana, a Sanyasi, a Sudra or whatever, but is well conversant in the science of Krishna. He can become a Guru. So the point here is that, that uh, the main qualification for somebody to become a spiritual master or Guru is not what caste he is born in or uh, what ashrama that he is in. That is not the main criteria. main criteria is he is conversant with the science of Krishna. That is the main aspect for somebody to become a spiritual master, like that. That's the main point, uh, main theme of this purport, actually. And then, in those days, people used to beg the household brahmanas to initiate the mitzvahs because they wanted to become successful in one Ashma institution and then become free from material desires, it seems. But, uh, but Chidra Mahaprabhu is indicating and then Prabhupada is substantiating that it uh, doesn't matter which ashram somebody is there, and it doesn't matter which 
which cash they're born, doesn't matter all those things. Primarily, what matters is their understanding and their conviction in the science of Krishna. That's what matters like that. And realization, of course. So, yeah, the Supreme Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu understood the weakness of society in maintaining that only a Grostha Brahmana should be a speech master. That's why, uh, as long as a speech master is convert, uh, conversant in the essence of the Shastra, he must understand Supreme Person of the Godhead. So, then actually, Diksha is defined in the purport. It says, Diksha actually means initiating a disciple with transcendental knowledge. That's the main point of the initiation. And that he speech must gives transcendental knowledge. By which he becomes free from all material contemplation. That means we become purified with transcendental knowledge. So, speech master is the one who can give us transcendental knowledge. That's the point being stressed here. Not necessarily the ashrama like that. So, now next verse, 112. Uh, now, Madhvacharya was going into South India and Madhvacharya, Madhvata, Madh, sorry, Madhvacharya, Madhvendra Puri was going in South India and he visited Remuna. Remuna is a temple is a location where this Gopinath Deity temple, uh, that temple is, uh, this Remuna is a place very close to Jagannath Puri. It's a Norissa basically. That's where he went, it seems. And when he saw the beauty of the Gop Gopinath Deity here, Madhavendra Puri was overwhelmed with the beauty, it seems. And then when he went to that uh, corridor of the temple, where generally people view the Deity from, he chanted and danced there, it seems, in the courtyard of the temple, basically. Uh, we, we heard... Chitin Mahaprabhu also visited Remuna and then danced and chanted there. Then he sat down there and asked a Brahmana what kinds of foods are offered to the deity like that he asked. Not to, not to find out how to enjoy the food. That was not the purpose of asking the food. So um, basically, we'll find out in, in a couple of verses that also. So from the excellence of the arrangements, Madhavipur, he understood the that only the best food was being offered that like that he understood it seems that's why he thought uh, he will also inquire from the priest what foods are offered to Gopinath this deity so that he can make similar arrangements in the kitchen and for offering similar foods to Gopal deity that is there in Vrindavan so that was his thought process for a service for example somebody is good at book distribution they go to a temple they go to a new temple they find out how they are doing book distribution, how they are displaying books in the temple, uh, how they are, uh, what kind of techniques they are using to distribute books. Like that, they are very open to the ideas like that, right? Similarly, Madhavan is here for the service, sake of service. He is trying to find out what kind of foods are offered to the DD, Gopinath DD, so he can do the same thing, replicate the same at his hometown. With uh, I'll, Hometown is the wrong answer, maybe. Wrong point, wrong way to say it. But, uh, going back to Vrindavana, where the DTE worships primarily. He wants to establish the same practices like that. So now, 116 verse, there is no purport for these verses. So 116th verse, uh, when he asked the Brahmana priest about the what foods are offered, he explained in detail, it seems, all the foods are offered to the deity of Gopina. Then Brahmana, but the Brahmana priest especially said one thing. What is that? In the evening, the deity is offered sweet rice in 12 earthen pots. 12 pots made of earth and because the taste is as good as nectar, Amrita it is named Amrita Keli it seems, so that sweet rice it is especially that sweet rice is very famous is very celebrated throughout the world as Gopinatha Shira because Gopinatha the deity they call it Shira, that sweet rice is called Shira, so Gopinatha Shira and it is not offered anywhere else in the world, it is so wonderful it seems so now, even now when you visit that temple, they still give uh, kheer in the yathan parts for all the devotees who visit there actually. Then, Madhavendra Puri was, uh, while he was talking to the Brahmana priest about this, then the sweet rice was placed before the deity it seems, to offer boga. Hearing this, Madhavendra Puri started thinking like that. If, without my asking, so this is important. This comes out in the next few verses. Without my asking, a little sweet rice is given to me. I can then taste it and make a similar preparation to my deity, Lord Gopala, like that is thinking. So the why is the without my asking is important? It comes up in few more verses because he's in the higher stage of sannyasa, paramsa stage. He didn't care whether somebody gave food or not. 
If somebody gives food, he will eat. Otherwise, he doesn't just fast it seems. That's why he's saying without my asking. And then he, wa he wants to taste that some 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 people have this great skill. Actually, it's a wonderful skill. I don't know how they have it, but when they taste something, they can make out the recipe of the food. More, what what ingredients are there? How they made it like that? So that's what I'm remembering when I see, see this line here like that. And they can even remember the small spices also. It seems I heard some people like that. So that's what he was thinking. Then, but he immediately became greatly ashamed because. He desired to sweet taste the sweet rice. Uh, so then he immediately began to think of Lord Vishnu. Because why is he thinking like that? Because the offering was offering was not yet completed. The offering is, is Boga is still going on like that for Lord. So while he was thinking of the Lord Vishnu like that, offering was completed, it seems. Then the Arti started. And after the Arti finished, the no purports, yeah, no purport till after Arti was finished, Mahasman Puri offered his obeisance to deity and then he left the temple room and he did not say anything anymore to anybody. Meaning, point is that he did not express his desire. Oh, I wish I can taste the sweet rice so I can cook for my deity like that. He did not tell anybody. That is the point being made here. Now, one to the third verse, oh, this verse has a purport. Um, Mahasman Puri. Avoided begging. That means he, he was a, at a Paramahasa stage of uh, sannyasa. He didn't even go begging for food like that. But lower sannyasis, they go for begging with the food also. Then he was completely unattached, it seems, and indifferent to material things. That means if there's no food coming to him, nobody gives food and food, he will just fast like that. That is the exalted nature of him as the Paramahasa stage. In the purport, a couple of uh, words are described. Ayachita vritti. And our Ajagara Vritti, these are the two words used of what he is practicing. Uh, and they are defined also. Ayachita Vritti means that uh, accustomed to refrain from begging. Achita, Achita means begging. Ayachita means not begging, basically. He is refraining from begging. And Ajagara Vritti, Ajagara means, Vritti means one is compared to Python, it seems. Python is a big snake that doesn't make effort to get food it seems. If some food comes from close to his mouth only, then it opens and takes the food like that. Here it even Prabhupada says that rather or less the food come automatically within his mouth also. He is saying Prabhupada. But basically very close to him basically. Then only he will, it doesn't make much endeavor for getting food it seems. So similarly as a Paramusa, he simply engages in exclusive service of the Lord without caring even for eating and sleeping like that it seems. That is a great stage he was then. So he conquers the desire for eating, sleeping, and sense gratification, it seems, at the higher stage, in the Paramahansa stage, like that. So going going on to 124th verse, this also has a purport. Uh, a Paramahansa like Madhavendra Puri is always satisfied in the loving service of the Lord. That means when he's satisfied in the loving service like that, then he doesn't have any lower desires or material desires to eat so much, so sleep like this, like that kind of things. The, those desires are not there. That's the point here. And then material hunger and thirst cannot impede his activities. Because main focus is loving devotion service to Krishna. Material hunger and thirst doesn't impede his activities. In fact, Parishim Maharaj also says uh, uh, in the second canto, uh, I was reading yesterday. So he, was, he basically tells to Sukhudeva Goswami to encourage him. Okay, please go on speaking Krishna Kada. Actually, I'm not feeling any hunger or thirst also like that when I'm hearing Krishna Kada. That's what is being described here. So then, when he desired to taste a little sweet rice offered to the deity, he considered that he committed an offense by desiring to eat what was being offered to the deity like that. So, Prabhupada gives some a couple of wonderful teachings for us in this, in this uh, section, in this purport actually. One is, uh, simple practice of deity worship, which is when we are going, when we are offering deity boga, you probably seen in the temple, especially this practice is followed. Uh, is, yeah, temple especially, but some devotees do it at home also, but very, very few I've seen at least. So basically, uh, from the kitchen, when the food is going before Krishna to offer, they cover it with a cloth, cloth or napkin like that. So that way, no other living entities, even human, not only human beings, but no other living entities see that basically till the 
plate goes before Krishna like that. And the plate goes before Krishna, then the offering, that cloth or water covering is taken out like that. That's one principle or practice Prabhupada is describing uh, in the purport like that. And then uh, the purpose of that is uh, so that nobody makes an offense by wanting to eat like that. That offering before Krishna honors it like that. That is a one of the purpose Prabhupada is coming in the purport. So nobody should be given a chance to see it. Uh, if somebody desires to eat, that is an offense like that is saying. Then um, yeah, another point in the purport Prabhupada is making is the Paramsa devotee uh, is actually great and is called Vijita Sadguna, it seems. That means he has conquered six material qualities. What are those? Like we hear in Bhagavata. Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Matsarya and uh, Shuddha, Trishna. That is another word is used here. Um, what, is the Shuddha, what are those English words for this? Lust, anger, greed, illusion, enviousness. Normally in Bhagavata we hear about pride, right? Here that is replaced with Shuddha, Trishna. That means Shuddha means hunger, Trishna means thirst like that. The pride is replaced with uh, hunger and thirst in this context here by Prabhupada. So that is a paramsa. Basically, paramsa has conquered all these bad qualities that we anybody might have. Now, 125th verse, this also has a purport. Madhuran Puri left the temple and is sat down in a village marketplace. Village marketplace means a shopping area, but in the olden days, there will be nobody. In the evening, by the time of evening, it will become deserted. Nothing will be there in the shops, basically. It's an open marketplace like that. So it was vacant, it seems. Sitting there, he began to chant. Prabhupada highlights this point in the purport. In the meantime, the temple priest laid the deity down to rest. So the 125, right? Yeah. Prabhupada makes a point that Madhavinda Puri was not interested in eating or sleeping. His interest in chanting is the mantra, Mahamantra. He was so acute that uh, even at that stage of Paramsa, he is chanting. So that means even in Paramsa stage, one cannot give up chanting. That's the point Prabhupada makes like that. Some people think, okay, I'll chant a lot now and become purified and I throw my beads their way. I don't need to chant anymore like that. So that's not the point. When we, as we go on chanting, actually we develop taste for chanting. So we can want to chant more and more like that. That is one point Prabhupada makes in the purport. That uh, Haridas Thakur and Goswami is also engaged in fixed number of rounds of chanting. That too, on the beads. So that's why chanting on the beads is very important for us also. Uh, even though one may become a paramsa like that, Prabhupada is writing. This is commonly we ask this this question is asked, right? Whether why are you chanting uh, on the beads like that? So to to keep the count like that. And then that's one of the reasons, of course. Of course, we also hear that uh, the, we're engaged in the sense of touch also. Not only hearing, engaging in the sense of hearing and um, sense of speaking with the tongue but also sense of touch also like that also is described apart from maintaining the count. Um, and the point Prabhupada makes is the chanting can be executed anywhere, either inside or outside the temple. So Madhavendra Puri was sitting in the marketplace and chanting. That example Prabhupada gives to say that we can chant anywhere like that. A Paramsa is engaged, always engaged in chanting and rendering service to the Lord. Uh, and chanting uh, all the nine process of devotion service are identical with each other like that is discussed in the purport. That means any one of them is good for perfection. Interestingly, Pada Sevenam Prabhupada translates in the purport as seva or service, serving. And then Dasham, he translates as carrying out order. Normally, we hear Dasham as a servant like that, right? So he says carrying out orders. Those are two observations in the purport. And then, devotee is expected to ex ex accept all nine process of devotion service. But even if only one process is properly executed, he can still attain the highest perfection, Paramahamsa stage, and go back home, back to Godhead. That's how Prabhupada is concluding that purport. Now, the next few verses again don't have purports. Um, basically, after finishing the daily duties, the priest went to take rest. Remember in the previous verse, we already heard that he put the deity to rest like that. Then he went back to take rest, uh, to sleep on the bed basically. 
and then the dream he saw the gopinath deity come to talk to him and spoke as follows what did gopinath tell in the de- dream of the priest oh priest please get up and open the door of the temple i kept one pot of sweet rice for the sanyasi madhavendra puri so this is the essence of the whole past time basically lord is telling that i kept a pot of i stole a pot of sweet rice for my devotee madhavendra puri basically and this pot of sweet rice is just behind my cloth curtain and why pujari didn't see you didn't see it because of my tricks that means normally pujari takes care of everything make sure nothing is there on the altar like that everything is clean like that and goes like that right so because of krishna's tricks obviously we, nobody can see <laughs> so he kept the pot rice for him it seems behind and then and then is telling him that a sanyasi named madhavendra puri is sitting in the vacant marketplace please take this sweet rice pot from behind me and deliver it to him like that is telling he is giving an order to pujari and then the pujari immediately got up and interestingly he thought it wise to take a bath before entering the deity room so even though it's an extraordinary circumstance middle of the night because he went on to the bed that is considered mode of ignorance and he want i wanted to go before dt do before dt we go with a clean cloth right clean body and clean cloth so he is going be uh, taking bath and going to the deity room like that then only he opened the temple door like that this is another nice lesson we can learn also from here how before we go in the dt before dt we need to be clean of course this is very important for the temple especially and for home also we can follow to most extent almost all the time like that so now text 131 is there a purport no okay text one three. according to the dt's directions like where the dt told it's behind the curtain like that right he found the pot the priest found the pot of sweet rice and he removed the pot and again see he mopped up the place see this is one of the good quality of brahmana and dt those who do dt worship they keep the place clean every time so if there's some food there offered uh, after taking out the food we clean the place like that of course this is especially important for a temple worship so then he went back to then he went out of the temple it seems after that uh, so that means he didn't leave the cleaning for later on he took it out right away and then he closed the door of the temple he went to the village with pot of sweet rice and he called out in every stall in the marketplace in search of madhavendra puri so he he called whose name is madhavendra puri please come and take this pot gopinath has stolen this pot of sweet rice for you so this is the point proper emphasis in the purport that krishna is absolute there is a difference between absolute truth and relative truth when krishna steals something it is a source of transcendental pleasure in fact krishna is glorified as mark and chore like that so like that uh, is not being hidden whereas somebody steals in the metal world is called a criminal like that so like that um, but m- mundane people cannot uh, understand this nature of krishna they'll think oh krishna is immoral like that kind of thing they'll say so but if a devotee approaches the supreme person to godhead for an immoral purpose or a moral purpose he becomes purified but lord doesn't become infected just because some impure a uh, devotee with impure qualities came before him like that like how sun sometimes operate even uh, urine like that still sun doesn't get impure like that so if one comes to supreme lord even out of lust anger or fear he is purified that doesn't mean that we should go with that qualities we should try to purify ourselves as much as possible and then uh, the activities of gopis are accepted as highest form of worship because it lost krishna who they approached with the lust it is as at the dead of night this is lust is not material lust so gopis when they approach that's also highest desires of uh, worshiping to krishna is describing propad mm. yeah so another important point this also emphasized in bhagavad bhagavatam also actually second canto one must understand krishna in tattva truth one should use common sense and consider that if simply by chanting krishna's holy name one is purified how can the person become immoral by touching the holy name itself by chanting the holy name we become purified then how does the original personality get to become contaminated like that so that is why 
but the common people cannot understand this. That is why the injection is given that we should not discuss Krishna's pastimes with common people like that. Even pastimes like Krishna stealing butter also. Krishna playing with uh, young girls in Vraja also. Uh, or Rasila pastimes also. Anything, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not do that and Prabhupada did not do that, anything in public like that. But instead, what did they do? They encouraged the public in the chanting of the holy name. That's what we are meant to do on a huge scale like that Purport is describing for us as a lesson for us to learn. Now, text 134. Uh, so, 133 already. Okay, we can continue uh, from 134 in the next session. We'll pause here. Sri Chaitanya Chitam Thakki Jai, Krishna Daskaraj Goswami Ki Jai, Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Let's offer obeisance to all the devotees of the Lord. Vancha Kalpata Rubyasya Kupasindu Bhyevacha Paditanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namnamha. Thank you so much, devotees. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yeah, Hare Krishna.